Well, it's great to spend some time with you today. What a blessing it is that the Lord is gracing us with this Exploring Catholicism program. I'm Father Jay Donahue. I kind of go by the name Padre Jay because of my love for Our Lady of Guadalupe and for the experiences I got to have in Mexico. Being a Catholic priest there is just such a blessing. And today we have such a great blessing to go deeper into the Word of God and be able to hear Him speak. And, you know, over the last few months, we've been uh, discussing different things about our faith. We looked at it from a perspective of an athlete. We looked at it from a perspective of people who are making impact in our society through marriage and through uh, serving our church. And so today, what better way to just really jump into the new school year than with a professor, but most importantly, to be able to renew that great love for the Lord's words, especially through sacred scripture. And I think we'll all find that uh, our liturgy and our Catholic faith truly is the, the great mother of this great uh, gift that we've been given in scripture. And so as a priest, you know, we go on these different retreats every once in a while. We have ongoing formation uh, that we try to plug into. And I have been inspired from the first time I got to meet Dr. John Bergsma as a priest to want to go deeper into understanding what is the Lord saying, me, saying to me through sacred scriptures, through the Bible. We read it every day in our liturgy. We, we pray over it all the time. And there are so many dimensions of how God's divine power can just transform our lives. I think back one time when I was trying to discern my vocation, I'd pick up Psalm 23 and just go through those basic three words, he leads me. And those three words are what I pray to God every day. I can just let the love of the Lord lead. I hope he leads this program. I hope he leads us in our discussion. So it's a great to be able to welcome Dr. John Bergsma. Uh, he's a professor of theology at Franciscan University in Steubenville, a former Protestant pastor. Dr. Bergsma entered the Catholic Church in 2001 while getting his PhD in the Bible from uh, the University of Notre Dame. I don't know if he's a fighting Irish fan, but uh, we could uh, talk about that too. A close, a close collaborator and a dear friend of Dr. Scott Hahn, and I know big fan of the St. Paul um, Biblical Institute where I was able to listen to him through his retreats. Dr. Bergsma speaks regularly on Catholic radio and conferences, parishes nationally and internationally. He's authored tons of books, uh, you know, one being Bible Basics for Catholics, which I find to be a great introduction into the Bible and reading it, especially for Catholics. Uh, Stunned by Scripture, also a Catholic introduction to the, the Old Testament, which has been very helpful to me for coming on the set. I was telling him that I might be stealing stuff from there for my homilies on the Old Testament, and he was open to that. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Bergsma gives talks and studies that are available on CDs, MP3s, and his most recent book, which we'll be discussing as well, is Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, Revealing the Jewish Roots of Christianity. He and his dear wife, Don, have, are, have eight children. They live in the Steubenville area. And so, Dr. Bergsma, welcome to Exploring Catholicism. It's great to see you. What was it like growing up in a family, uh, I believe, uh, Dutch Calvinists, and your dad was a naval chaplain? What was it like to explore Catholicism from a Calvinist perspective? <laughs> well, it, you know, it's interesting, uh, Father Jay. Um, we uh, we have catechisms in the Calvinist tradition as well, but they're all they're they're virtually all the flip side of the Catholic catechism. So uh, I've described it like growing up uh, Calvinist is like learning Catholicism in reverse. Oh. So it's like the, the mirror image or the shadow or whatever. So, you know, we, we would learn, this is what Catholicism teaches and, and, and we deny that. <laughs> so all these, all these points. It's kind of like your experience when you walk in and they would set up the Catholic mass after yours. Exactly. And you, you, you said at one point, what, when they're cross and then they yeah, remember that? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, growing up in uh, in, a, in a military family, uh, we would you know worship at the uh, Navy or Marine Corps Chapel, depending on what base you're on. But uh, all, all of the uh, the liturgical vestments uh, were double sided, so that you could have a Protestant service and then flip everything over and have Catholic Mass. <laughs> and I found this out when I was about seven years old. I watched a sailor come out and strike the set and set up for Mass and he grabbed this uh, plain gold cross that we had used for our, you know, Protestant worship service. And he flips it around. And there's a crucifix on the back of it. <laughs> so Just whip it out. So scandalized. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, it really seems like uh, the Lord did that to me. You know, he grabbed me at a certain point in my life and 
flipped me around and uh, showed that Catholic side of me that I never knew really existed. So you were born in Hawaii. Uh, how That's many right. brothers and sisters did you have? So I had four uh, older siblings, one sister and three older brothers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big, big gap between us, about six year gap. They were in a clump and then, and then me. And your dad, <laughs> a clump and then you. Your dad being a, a Protestant minister, did that affect you, inspire you to then uh, want to go into scripture and to want to be a part of uh, that faith? Yeah, I, I really think it did. I think, you know, we all ha are powerfully influenced by our fathers, right? And uh, seeing my dad as a man of prayer, a preacher of the word of God, um, that made a powerful impression on me and my understanding of what it meant to be a man, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful to my dad for that, that he modeled the, the idea that a, a true man devotes himself to the word of God. And I think you see that in the personal histories of myself and all my brothers, uh, all of us uh, prepared for the seminary. Um, two of us made it out, you know, <laughs> <Made> it out. <laughs> yeah, as it were, but I mean, you know, we, we all really were powerfully influenced by my father and, and, and have followed in his legacy in different ways. But your mom also, um, influenced you. Was she yeah. the one who, I, I remember hearing that you, you, one of the things that helped you understand scripture was spending a year in scripture and maybe yes. some of the devotionals that yeah. the Calvinists had, was that your mom's influence or where did you come Definitely from? was. Yeah. So, you know, around the age, age 12, uh, my mother started me on a program of reading the Bible through in a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a little devotional similar to, you know, compare it to Magnificat or something like this. But, um, you know, it would come uh, once a month and it would have every day of the month divided out uh, with, you know, four to five chapters uh, of scripture a day. And that was my devotional practice, you know, starting from about age 12 all the way through uh, college. And I'm sure that had a, a major influence on my decision to, uh, to go into scripture professionally. Yeah. And so uh, did you study in Hawaii? Did you move away to do studies once you started to discern that you wanted to go into a more uh, seminary style life? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when I was a senior in high school in Hawaii, you know, many options open to uh, to me in terms of different, you know, colleges and universities to go to. And I spent a lot of time in prayer, real, real time of discernment. But I very clearly heard the Lord saying, to follow the path that would lead to being a pastor, you know, in, in the denomination that I belong to. And there was only one basic route for that, which was our denominational college and, and seminary, which is in Western Michigan. So I went from the sunny shores of Oahu oh, to, uh, to yeah, Michigan, the chillier shores of Lake Michigan <laughs> and uh, I began to pre prepare for the ministry. But um, yeah, so that's, you know, um, uh, it, it, West Michigan was where I went and, and did my preparatory work and then my years in seminary and met my wife. And so yeah. So how did you meet your wife? Yeah. Good question. Well, I was originally chasing her roommate. <laughs> <laughs> if you're honest about this. Yeah, sure. You know, You're in so, Michigan. Uh, yeah, is that yeah, right? Was, yeah, there was, yeah, it was, it was uh, Calvin college Calvin in, college. in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Yep. Uh, so, um, but uh, you know, I met my wife indirectly, but um, uh, yeah, it was over coffee. Um, not everybody drank coffee, but she and I drank coffee and that was, <laughs> that was the start of something. And, uh, you know, this, you know, when I, from, from the very beginning, whenever I was around my wife, Dawn, uh, there was always a sense of peace being with her, you know, even before we had interest in each other. Um, there was a sense that, oh, this is comfortable. You know, this, this feels right. And that's always, you know, characterized our relationship. And uh, so we, we knew each, each other casually. Uh, we went on spring break. Uh, she sent me uh, a bunch of uh, jelly beans. Oh, boy, jelly beans. <laughs> Care, care of jelly beans. <laughs> and that was a path to my heart. I sent her a, a, a tape of um, a Gregorian chant, actually. Oh. Uh, and then followed that up with uh, Vince Guaraldi, who's the, uh, the jazz composer that did all the Peanuts uh, specials mm -hmm. on TV. And uh, jelly beans and music, uh, yeah. That, jelly beans and peanuts. It yeah, just seems yeah, like it yeah. works together really well, the yeah, music that, there. <laughs> exactly. And uh, did you have to ask her father uh, for her hand in marriage? And how did that experience did. go? Was yeah. that a... we, we dated for a year, and then I talked to her dad, and, um, and then proposed on a bridge over the Grand River uh, one evening in the spring of, uh, that would have been uh, 92, 1992. And... Uh, I gave her a little book that says uh, how to be a pastor's wife. And uh, <laughs> I said, do you want to keep this book? And she said, yeah, I think I'll keep it. So, okay, great. And I 
pulled a ring out of my pocket. <laughs> I said, well, you'll need a pastor to go with that. <laughs> and, uh, so that was my indirect way of proposing. But uh, it was really quite a wonderful, uh, special thing. We, had, we just had a very a blessed courtship. Right. And you both kind of had the same attitude towards kind of the theology of marriage, even though you weren't Catholic right. at the time. It seems like the yeah. theology of the body, or at the very least, the openness to life was something that uh, you both uh, had discerned and, and wanted to be a part of your marriage. Yeah, absolutely. When it came to talking about, um, you know, planning for children, I went to my mom to get advice. And, um, you know, this is striking. My mom actually recommended that we go get um, training for marriage or preparation for marriage from a Catholic parish wow. and learn natural family planning. And, and I had a lot of respect for my mom. I said, well, this is the Lord speaking through my mother. So we're just going to do this. So yeah, we just picked a random Catholic parish uh, out of a brochure uh, from the couple to couple league actually, mm -hmm. and uh, went there and, and got that uh, CCL uh, training in NFP as, as a Protestant couple. That's a funny story that we'll, we'll save for some other time. Uh, being a being Because there wouldn't have been a lot of Catholic there, uh, Protestant yeah. couples no, in there, right? there were not a lot of Protestant <laughs> couples. We were the guaranteed the only one. And, uh, but it was an interesting experience. And so, yeah, and, and through that process, we became open to life. And, uh, and so we, we practiced natural family planning from the beginning of our marriage, never, ever uh, expecting that we would actually become Catholic. You right. know, we just thought, well, this is, you know, every clock is, is right once, once a day, right? So we thought, well, the Catholics, you know, this is like, the, they got this right, you know, uh, by accident. Um, but, uh, but it was an important step actually. And, and if you trace it back, you could probably, you know, trace the dominoes in our life history back to making that decision and then eventually becoming Catholic ourselves in, in a certain way. Before we get into that, could you just race down your eight kids and tell them about something, a little shout out to them, or we'll just be praying with you as you go through the names of your kids. Yeah, absolutely. So Peter, 24 years old, working full-time as a programmer, just graduated from Franciscan. Johannes, our second, uh, he's in the history program, plans to be a, probably a librarian. Um, Hope, uh, my oldest daughter, uh, number three in the lineup, uh, is in the nursing program at Franciscan. Um, Christian, my uh, third son, uh, is in the accountancy uh, program um, uh, at Franciscan. Uh, let's see, Rose, my second daughter, is beginning her freshman year in criminal justice. She wants to be a policewoman oh, great. at Franciscan. Uh, my second, uh, third daughter, Lucia, is an aspirant to a religious order in Steubenville, and uh, she is in her junior year of homeschooling. Praise God. And then I've got uh, Francis, my 10-year-old, who's... Um, just in the middle of the mix there, later elementary. And then uh, my youngest, uh, Nikki, is our, our very special kid. He's um, uh, developmentally delayed with autism, goes to a special academy in, in near Youngstown. Um, but he's he's the most joyful of the Bergsmiths. So he's our special gift from God. And uh, almost daily, you drive him there. So you yeah. guys have a very special relationship in it. I understand you pray through that and it's something exactly. that's really a part of your own yeah. charism as a dad, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a three hour round trip to get him to therapy every day in Youngstown. And so that gives us plenty of opportunity for prayer. Well, I think we're all praying for you <laughs> and your family. I think anybody stepping out like that into marriage and having such a heroic career like that, uh, we'll just be lifting you up. It's great that you both model what you're teaching and you practice that at home uh, yeah, we with, try. <laughs> with your wife. Now, there are some interesting connections uh, from what I understand when you were studying that brought you closer to the faith. One was just an indirect one. The fact that your dad was a big fan of Cardinal O'Connor. Yes. How did that happen? Does he have like a jersey of his? He's like <laughs> retired Cardinal O'Connor hat somewhere in the house yeah. or something? Yeah. So um, Cardinal O'Connor, uh, bef long before, oh well, yeah, say six years before he became Cardinal Archbishop in New York, he was the highest ranking U.S. Navy chaplain, what we oh, called the chief of chaplains. Okay. So the, the, the Navy typically only has one admiral that's a chaplain, and he, he's the top chaplain. So that was uh, uh, O'Connor. And um, he liked my dad, and they got along well. And so he chose my dad to be one of his staff officers. So they worked for two years in Washington, D.C., when O'Connor was in charge of the U.S. Navy Chaplain Corps. Got to be great friends. They were the same height, same build. So when O'Connor retired from the U.S. Navy, he gave my dad all his old uniforms, and we still have them in the family house uh, near Grand Rapids in Michigan. 
So anyway, there's, there's that little connection. My first Catholic mass, Father Jay, was actually the mass for the religious of the Archdiocese of New York on the evening before the inauguration of him, of him as, as Archbishop. Oh so that was my very first mass um, that, I, that I sat through. I, I still remember it, St. Patrick's Cathedral, all the religious of New York, virtually all in black. And then I was in my, my best clothing, which was a, a green corduroy sport coat. <laughs> and they put us kind of in the middle of the, of the cathedral. <laughs> I just felt like I was throbbing. I was probably 12 years old, certainly the youngest person present. <laughs> So anyway, um, so, but that, that friendship with Cardinal Connor, you know, he came to our house uh, occasionally, uh, really helped me to have a kind of a, uh, a, a comfortableness with priests that made it easier when, when the time came to, to uh, you know, go through that conversion process to the Catholic Church. Yeah, and one of the things that Cardinal Connor was for me as a hero in the pro-life world, Absolutely. And starting the, 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 the Sisters for Life and his love for the preborn and yeah. it's obviously something that is stirred in your heart even before you became a Catholic. So sure. he was definitely a, uh, an apostle of life you know, at a time that that, that was certainly. Really and I think he gained the respect of a lot of pro-life Protestants for that. Yeah. So as you were studying, uh, you had a conversation with a dear friend of yours named Michael Daphne, I think it was right. Yeah. And as you guys uh, started to go deeper into your um, understanding and exploring of Catholicism, it was kind of a, a turning point for you, wasn't it? Just to be able to intellectually speak to somebody who could, uh, well, let's say keep up with you, because I think sometimes as Catholics, we probably need a little bit of pushing intellectually yeah. to get to some of the levels that maybe you were on. Did yeah. you feel that way? And was Michael kind of an instrument for you? Then? Yeah, definitely. You know, Michael, as, as I've often said, he had three qualities I never thought I'd find in one person. He was highly intelligent, full of the Holy Spirit, and Catholic. <laughs> And I didn't see how you could get, all I get any of those three <laughs> in that there. You know, I thought if you're full of Holy Spirit and, and intelligent, then you would leave the Catholic Church. You know, uh, maybe there's some spirit filled Catholics who are just too stupid. They don't realize they're in the wrong organization, you know, but he, he but, but the, the point of my saying that, though, Father Jay, is that I couldn't explain away his Catholicism as either being due to ignorance or indifference. Mm -hmm. And that's how I categorize Catholics in my life up to that point. Although, you know, it's strange. I don't know what I thought of Cardinal O'Connor because he was clearly neither of those either. I just, maybe I'd never asked the question. Right. But most of the Catholics I, I, I met are like, well, you know, they're just Catholic because they're indifferent. They're going through the motions or they're just Catholic because they, they, they're ignorant of, you know, church history or something like this. But, you know, Michael was Catholicism in the face. Can't explain it away. Um, something is definitely keeping this guy in the Catholic church and I wanted to know what it was. So, yeah, he was one of the first persons I met when I began my graduate program in, in scripture at the University of Notre Dame. And I was so fascinated by him, you know, in, in a sense, as to like why he didn't just self combust or something, you know, because <laughs> these contradictions, you yeah, know, right. So how could how could he be so smart and so passionate about Jesus and not realize that, you know, the Catholic Church is wholly corrupt and, 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 and it clouded over the gospel and everything. So we started to meet uh, weekly, and, um, and and yeah, as you alluded, Father, he really beat me up at my own game. I mean, he did something very unfair. He he would respond to my objections with scripture. <laughs> and when he did that, I was offended. I was like, no, that's my game. You're supposed to quote the, the, the right. quotes did, or something. Wasn't there a debate about Mary, <laughs> Queen of Heaven, and he pulled Revelation out? How did that go? Yeah, yeah. So, so um uh, th there, was a, there was this one day when we were in the food court at the University of Notre Dame, and he had just answered like two or three objections from Scripture. I was so frustrated. So I was casting around for something that, that would just stump him. And my eyes happened to glance at an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe that was on the wall. And I got an idea. Oh, Queen of Heaven. Press him on Queen of Heaven. So I challenged him. I said, I, I challenge you to show me one Scripture that supports this idea of Mary as Queen of Heaven. And without missing a beat, he's like, well, Revelation 12. I was like, Revelation who? He's like, Revelation 12. Have you ever read it? Of course, I've read Revelation 12. So he gets it out, and we begin reading. And, of course, you know the passage well. But it's this woman who's obviously in the heavens because she's clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and stars on her head. So she's got to be up in the sky. And she's got a crown, so she's obviously a queen. And then she gives birth to the Messiah in verse 5. And I felt like, you know, in a martial arts contest, you know, where I'd just been slammed to the mat, I couldn't believe that I had forgotten such a such an obvious scripture. But the thing, the interesting thing is, Father Jay, I'd read that scripture many times, 
never occurred to me to apply it to the Blessed Mother. You know, it's just like you don't think about the things you don't think about. Right. Right. So, um, you know, I've just been oblivious to that. And, and so that really was a turning point, Father, because, uh, you know, I went away thinking, gosh, you know, what other scriptures might be right under my nose that really lend themselves to the Catholic faith? And I'm not aware of it. Right. And I think for me, Dr. Bergsma, what your experience is teaching me and perhaps others as well is that we need to have confidence that God's truth is yeah bedrock. I mean, it, it, the more you d dive into scripture and the truth of our Catholic faith, the more you realize it is sturdy. It is like the most yeah. powerful, solid. It's embedded in everything. You just right. need to be open to the truth yeah. to yeah. set yourself free right. to be able to follow the Lord and have that yeah. confidence, right? Yeah. Church history is littered with individuals who come along and think that the church never uh, remembered a certain verse. Right. Oh, you never saw this verse. <laughs> yeah. You never saw that one. You. <laughs> Let me tell you, folks. <laughs> That's not the church has seen every verse in the Bible. There's not some verse that we forgot about, and and and, and, and that's what I was having to learn was right. was that you know the, the the fathers, the saints, they thought about everything, and there is an answer to everything, and we need to have that confidence as Catholics. And, and, you know, today you hear National Geographic, you see all the cable news shows on the Bible being made up, historicity, Jesus, whether he was really this or that. And uh, and for you, I believe one of the turning points for you to, to really um, come into the Catholic Church was something you read by St. Ignatius of, of Antioch, right. who would almost be like a second generation bishop, from what yeah. I understand. You know, he probably learned under uh, John the Apostle. And so we're talking you know, less than 100 years after Jesus, and you read his letter, St. Ignatius of Antioch's letter to Smyrna. And I just wanted to read this because it, 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 it really sets a tone of after the scriptures, these church fathers become this next level of maturing of our Catholic faith. And uh, oh, geez, the alarm went off. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> so this is what uh, St. Ignatius uh, writes. He says, pay close attention to those who have uh, wrong notions about the grace of Jesus Christ, which has come to us. And note how at variance they are with God's mind. They care nothing about love. They have no concern for widows or orphans, for the oppressed, for those in prison or released, for the hungry or the thirsty. And then he presses on. And mind you, this is a bishop being marched off to be uh, martyred in Rome. And he's writing this to his faithful, I imagine, in Smyrna. And he says, they hold aloof. Again, these people who he's saying, we cannot allow these people to, we have to really challenge them. They hold aloof the Eucharist from their, their services of prayer because they refuse to admit that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins, which in his goodness, the Father raised. Yeah. Why did that? I mean, I, I read it and I shudder right now. It's just so yeah, exciting it's, to think a so bishop powerful. like in the year 100 or whatever wrote that. But what yeah. What did that do to you? Yeah. Well, Mike and I were having this argument over scripture and we kind of reached a stalemate. Yeah. So he suggested, why don't we read the church fathers and, and uh, see how the fathers interpret scripture and let the fathers cast the vote between our two positions. And I thought I was going to win this. Of course, I was one of this confident that the earliest fathers were going to turn out to be Calvinists. Of course, I'd never read them. <laughs> so we got the earliest of the church fathers. Ignatius is, you know, arguably one of the earliest. And so just a few years after the death of, of John. So I'm reading through, he's saying many things that sound scarily Catholic and, and certainly not Calvinist. But I get to that passage where, where he's, you know, again, as you say, he's about to be martyred. And, and so these are kind of some of the last words to these different churches that, that he's writing to. And, uh, and he says in there, you know, stay away basically from anyone who refuses to confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our savior, Jesus Christ, right. which the father raised in his goodness for our salvation, which, which suffered for our sins and which the father raised in, in, in uh, his goodness for our salvation. And um, I looked at that and, and I felt like he was talking to me because I was part of a group that denied, refused to confess that the Eucharist was the flesh of Jesus Christ. Um, among our creeds was, was a statement that said that the Catholic mass was a condemnable idolatry because in the mass, bread and wine were worshiped as if they were God. 
And so we explicitly rejected the real presence as part of our doctrinal standard. And so when I read that early testimony here in say maybe the year 106, um, to the real presence, uh, several things dawned on me. One was this must have been what he received from the Apostle John himself, since he had been trained by the Apostle John. And there wasn't enough time for him to get confused about it. So it had to be authentic testimony. Therefore, this is the original teaching of Christianity. Therefore, it wasn't the Catholic Church that abandoned original Christianity. It was my group that abandoned Christianity. Therefore, I am a heretic. Okay. In fact, he's talking to you. <laughs> Therefore, he's talking you kept to aloof. me. <laughs> exactly. You know, so it was it was as if he was reaching his hand across 2,000 years and giving a slap on the face and, and saying, You, John, are the heretic. And uh, yeah, so it was a moment of conviction. And um, within within I would say just a few hours of, of reading that and meditating on it, it, it began to dawn on me, I really have to become Catholic myself. Mm -hmm. And we just pause there for a moment to just praise God for the way in which the Holy Spirit led you to that. And now mm -hmm. you've become such a powerful instrument uh, for your students, for your family, and for priests like me. So what an amazing uh, way in which the Lord works yeah. through our, <laughs> our, our lives like this, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, just as a, a program note, if anybody's any questions for Dr. Bergsma, uh, please feel free to, to chime in by typing out uh, your question there. Also, we have several opportunities to be able to read and understand how Dr. Bergsma has come to just tremendous insights into sacred scripture. He has a, um, a website that he runs called thesacredpage.com. Uh, I would be uh, alo aloof to admit that I sometimes uh, use that material for my own preaching. So sacredpage.com is one of my choice sites to go to for, for all things Sunday uh, readings. The secret the secret. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll just keep this between the two of us. I might give you a little thumb afterwards here. Uh, but at any rate, uh, you also wrote a book on just the Bible basics for Catholics. And so those are all uh, great resources. So how do you get an A in Catholic understanding of scripture? You know, you being a professor, sure you encounter um, all kinds of students and, and people like me that we're constantly um, trying to, to grow in our love for scripture, but uh, let's face it, uh, we need to appreciate it more and be able to dive into it. So could you talk a little bit about scripture and its relationship to liturgy? Because I think as Catholics, the, the greatest and the most intimate exposure we have to the Bible Right. is through typically Sunday Mass or through the Mass experience. So yeah. talk a little bit about that historically and why that is such a like a connection between us and, and our and our scripture. Sure, sure. There's a lot of different things going on there, but um, when uh, when you when you study the Bible, uh, what becomes apparent is that this theme of covenant, which is you know, what is a covenant? Covenant is a family relationship made by swearing an oath to somebody. So that's like the dominant theme in the Bible. And there's several covenants in the scriptures and they all lead up to the new covenant. And that's that phrase, new covenant, that's something that we hear at every mass. And you could say that the, in a sense, the scriptures are nothing other than a history of all the covenants that preceded the new and everlasting one that we have, which is the Eucharist. So the Bible basically all points up to the Eucharist, and that's the result of studying the scriptures and getting into the heart. It finally dawned on me, well, they're all pointing to the new covenant. And what does Jesus identify as the new covenant? Well, in Luke 22, 20, he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which means consisting of my blood. Mm -hmm. So we can extend that to the body as well. So the body and blood of Jesus, that is the new covenant. So again, I'll say it again, the Bible points to, and it all leads up to the Eucharist. So study of scripture should, should end with receiving the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And Benedict XVI said that as well. He said, those that deny the real presence uh, then become unable to interpret the scriptures. I'm paraphrasing here sure, sure. on that. But, uh, but and, and when I read that for the first time, I thought, well, that's a kind of a strong statement. But then I pondered. I'm like, well, if the Bible is a history of covenants that point up to the new and everlasting one, and, and, and you aren't receiving the new and everlasting one, well, he's got a point. <laughs> okay. He might have something yeah, to say. He, on he that, might right? have, yeah, he might, might have a valid point there. So that's what I'd say. So, you know, 
it, it's amazing for me, Father Jay. I thought that I knew scriptures. Uh, I thought that that was something I kind of had under my belt and that the church was going to give me, you know, other benefits when I converted. But I was, I was shocked by how my understanding and appreciation of the scriptures took off after my conversion to Catholicism. Um, it, it was as if it went from black and white to technicolor in terms of, of my appreciation. Because what, what was happening was now I, I was beginning to experience the reality that the scripture points to. It's like somebody who's been studying the menu from the local Chinese restaurant for years. Yeah. And then one day somebody comes to the door and says, hey, you want to actually visit the place? They're like, what? This place <laughs> really exists? Like, yeah, come along. And you go over and you order General Tso's chicken and you start eating like, wow, <laughs> this is what the menu has been describing all this time, you know? So that's a little bit what my personal experience was, you know, in, in coming into the church. And yeah, and, and so that makes sense even historically too. So mm -hmm. we all have that deep personal experience of the Eucharist and how the word leads us to uh, the word made flesh. Right. Um, but even historically, like who wrote the table of contents? How were the right. books of the Bible assembled? I mean, was liturgy a part of that selection yeah. process? Yeah, this is this is something that we didn't want to talk about outside the Catholic Church. Um, but if you actually look at the historical process that leads to the 72 books that we call the Bible, um, basically in the late 300s, when the Christianity became legalized and it was possible to hold church councils and so on, the church gathered together and said, okay, let's clarify what books are permissible to be read at mass. And they wrote down a list and that became the Bible. So in, a, in all seriousness, and I would defend this on the level of scholarship, the, the Bible was composed as a collection of books to be read at Catholic Mass. I, I can say that and, and, and defend that from an academic perspective. That's really what it is. The, 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 the Word of God, you know, the, 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 this, these books were collected for us to say, you know, the Word of the Lord, thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and then and just being able as a priest to proclaim the gospel that isn't just, oh, let's just remember something, but it actually right. comes alive as the word only can because it's God's divine word. And then even being able to say, oh, well, historically this or that. No, no, it was born from the experience of going to the Eucharist, it was born from the experience with Jesus Christ, which is the center, right. the fulcrum of all of scripture. Right. What would be some... Um, things that you've maybe experienced even with your students or you see with Catholics, it'd be a helpful way to get more out of the mass in terms of the liturgy of the word. Let's pretend that you're stuck with me. I don't give a good homily, but uh, you know, you still read scripture. You still have the song of the old Testament and usually the epistles and the gospel. Is there anything that you recommend in terms of just getting more out of the scripture and the word of God as a preparation to uh, the reception of Jesus? Yeah. Well, there's many good, uh, you know, uh, preparatory helps, you know, Magnificat is such a, a great magazine. Mm -hmm. My own blog, thesacredpage.com, about every Thursday I post a commentary on the readings. And so I'd encourage people to take advantage of some of these things. You know, other groups, other religious orders, other publishers and so on, produce those kind of mass helps that allow you to, uh, to read the readings with some understanding. Um, I, would, I would try to do that before going to the Sunday Mass. You know, at Franciscan University, we have this wonderful practice of what's called Lord's Day, which is like Saturday evening, all of the, um, the students start gathering together in, in groups to read the readings for the next day and, and talk about it. And uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful uh, practice at our university, which helps people to get more out of Mass. Do you participate in that, or do you do that with your family, the Lord's Day? For, um, for, yeah, for years, I would, I would uh, be part of that, part of a, a specific men's household, we call it, uh, that, would, uh, that would meet on Saturday evenings to do that. So what time and, would uh, they start? Like, what like was 4 p.m. 4 p.m. Yeah, 4 p.m. on gather Saturday. gather some food and stuff like that? Exactly. Or how's it work? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you know, typically, um, uh, well, they would have, um, you know, uh, uh, bread and wine, which is not, you know, it's not consecrated. Right. They would share it as kind of in a symbolic way, sure. you know, and, uh, and then afterwards, you know, go for dinner and, and oftentimes eat as a, eat as a household. So, but the primary it, function was they would read the Sunday scriptures. Exactly. And would they have a discussion on it yeah. or how would that yeah. unfold? Yep. Yeah. Would, would read them and then allow some quiet for them to sink in and then allow people to share 
you know, what, what they heard God speaking to them through those scriptures. And this would be a wonderful practice for Catholic families as well, you know, for Saturday dinner. Um, read the readings either before or after you eat and uh, or, you know, you could read them before you eat and sit down to spaghetti on a Saturday night and, and just talk about, hey, let's let's uh, did anybody see anything in there? Did anybody hear God speaking to them out of these readings and just have a little discussion like that? Yeah, I mean, if you just think back to last week's second uh, reading about don't conform yourself to the world, conform yourself to Jesus. And yeah. you think about just that basic challenge of that, how enriching that could be if you're with your family or friends. Let's just read this and see what are the ways we're either seeping into the world and losing our faith or the way we're getting to conform ourselves to, to Christ. I can't think of a, a better COVID activity because if you can't get to Mass because of the, the, yeah. the pandemic, well, you can still make the Lord's Day the Lord's Day, right? That's I mean, right. fine, you can't receive the Eucharist maybe, but at least this could be a practice that could help us during this COVID pandemic that when it's done, imagine right. how much more powerful it could be for us, you know? Absolutely, yeah. And it's it's a way of making that family dinner time kind of like a domestic Eucharist too. Correct. Yeah. yeah, I would just encourage anybody, especially in our grouping, if I can help at all or help be a catalyst for this, uh, you know, every weekend we always publish in our bulletin, which we call the Evangelion, the readings. So those come out usually right Thursday or Friday online. So if you need to get that or there's all kinds of resources that can tell you, because let's face it, we know what the readings are going to be yeah. from now until the end of the world. Because there's right. a cycle. So we got a huge advantage. There's no surprise here. It's yeah, like the word of God so steady and just like yeah. a drumbeat of love into our hearts. You know, Absolutely. So it's a it's a great way to. Uh, now, um, so some people look at scripture and they say, you know, like the creation story seems to be at odds with each other. Is, is it free of error? How can we have confidence in scripture when it just seems like science and all these other influences out there are saying, oh, the Bible is just a nice piece of literature. And in fact, I know a lot of theology programs in our Catholic church that just treat the Bible as such. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I would. It, it comes down to our faith in Jesus Christ, okay? And, and remember that Jesus Christ was, was no, no matter what you think of Jesus Christ, he was an impressive human being. Mm -hmm. Okay. To this day, the whole world dates its calendars from his birth. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's, I would call that making a splash on the scene of world history. <laughs> okay. So if, 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 think about this, if you want to uh, follow the man who, you know, arguably, uh, it's really not much of an argument. Who, who really has had the biggest impact on world history of all time, the, the most famous human being who has ever lived. If you want to model your life on him, okay, what he did was study this book that others are scoffing at, okay? <laughs> he studied these scriptures of the people of Israel, things like the Psalms, Proverbs, the prophets like Isaiah. That's where the world's most powerful, the most world's most impactful human being Ever. This is this is what he studied for his private, you know, uh, uh, you know, encouragement, edification, whatever. So if you, if you want to make a big impact in your life, um, you could do worse than follow the example of the most famous human being who ever lived. Yeah, it's amazing how people look at an NBA player, Zion Williams, and, and say, oh, if only I could wear Nike shoes like yeah, him, yeah. I could play like LeBron him. LeBron James. Say, okay, yeah. well, what's their pattern of working out? How yeah. do they do CrossFit and all that? So then I can do that. He said, okay, great. But if you want to get to heaven and be the saint that God's made you to be, well, Jesus revealed to us how to be that version of yourself. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to, you know, chuckle at, uh, at uh, Bible scholars. You know, we've talked about this. Many Bible scholars are not persons of great faith, sadly. And uh, they'll scoff at this or that problem in, in the scripture. And I think to myself, well, you know, it was good enough for Jesus, though. <laughs> it was good enough for the God, man. Right. <laughs> so, anyway. And, and speaking a little bit about the history and things and, um, you know, Dr. Bergsma, you have the blessing of going and leading pilgrimages to the Holy Land. And, and I hope that uh, someday we'll be able to, to do that. Uh, he, we were at a priest conference and he just kind of threw out there. Anybody would like to go on a pilgrimage, I would love to lead it. And I don't know how many took you up on that, but I was like, that is exactly what I'd love to do. Uh, being able to work with married couples with Renew the I Do. And I think taking married couples possibly to the Holy Land. Would, uh, would be great. But one of the things that's happened, well, basically in 1947 was kind of this uh, discovery into um, writings that were well, well a couple uh, centuries before Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So 
Tell them about the story of that. I heard they were skipping stones and all of a sudden yeah. they come into one of the greatest archaeological finds ever. It even makes uh, Indiana Jones look small, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so three Arab cousins who were uh, goat herds were walking down the shores of the Dead Sea with their flocks and one of them tossed a rock into a cave mouth. They heard the shattering of, of pottery, thought, hmm, there must be artifacts up there maybe gold, maybe something valuable. So they made a mental note of where that cave was, came back a few days later when they had some time, explored in there, and they pulled out three uh, ancient scrolls that uh, turned out were uh, up to uh, uh, 2,200 years old, dating all the way back to about 250 BC. One of, the, one of the scrolls that they pulled out was a copy of the book of Isaiah that radio dates to about, again, the year 250 BC in an almost perfect state of condition. So it did take them several months to figure out the value of what they had found. But once they figured it out and once uh, some Western scholars figured it out, then the race was on for what we call now the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. They eventually found uh, about a, the remains of, once, what, of what once were a thousand scrolls in one of the most impressive libraries in the ancient world in, in what was a, essentially a Jewish monastery there on the shores of the Dead Sea uh, of a cent uh, about, about a century before the birth of our Lord and then overlapping the, the life and the career of our Lord as well. So you wrote a book called Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which if, uh, if you have any questions about that, we'd love to give you a copy. If you have a question, we'll send you a copy of this. It's a great book. I recommend it, uh, Revealing the Jewish Roots of Christianity. Um, why'd you write the book? Yeah, I, I wrote the book after reading um, Brant Petrie's uh, wonderful uh, work, uh, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. And uh, I was so moved by Brant's book. At the end of it, I thought, you know, I want to do what Brant did, only not just for the Eucharist, for the entire life of Christianity, and I want to base it on the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that was the initial dream. Um, in God's providence, I went to a university, the University of Notre Dame, that, that is one of the world's maybe top three research institutions for Dead Sea Scrolls research. I didn't know that going in, but I certainly found out within a few days of starting classes there that this is what they were really good at at the University of Notre Dame. And um, so you know, like it or not, I got a lot of exposure to the scrolls during my doctoral program. And, and then as I began to teach as a professor at Franciscan University, over the years, it began to dawn on me how much the scrolls really revealed to us about the roots of our faith. And I wanted to put that in a book to encourage people's faith. So uh, just a little context. I mean, they discover the book of Isaiah, which we only had what a, a version that was about a thousand years old right so now we found a version that's two thousand years old right. and in that the context for those monks uh really describes a lot of what maybe judaism was like as jesus was growing up and uh, one of the things i love how have you pointed out is we we kind of encounter things in the new testament that we read it so much that we kind of like yeah. we breeze over it so like john the baptist eating locust and honey was this just a new diet? Was it because Zachariah and Elizabeth got fed up with him? He was eating too many cookies at home? Or what, what are those oddities yeah. like uh, for John the Baptist, for example? Yeah, this is fascinating. But um, the, the historian from the time period, a man by, just, uh, by the name of Josephus, who wrote histories that tell us about the life. Uh, uh, well, yeah, he mentions the life of Jesus as well as the life of John the Baptist and, and all their contemporaries and so on. Uh, but uh, th this historian lets us know that this, mon this monastic community of, of uh, Jewish men on the shores of the Dead Sea, they had very strict standards. And when you joined the monastery, you had to swear that you would never again eat food prepared elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Thus, when people got kicked out of the monastery, uh, they had to eat off the land or even starve to death. And um, so, you know, he, he writes about people eating grass and so on when they were kicked out. I think this is the explanation of John the Baptist. He's, when we look at John the Baptist in the Gospels, he's doing many things very similar to what we know about this monastic group. And yet he's just eating off the land. And, uh, you know, these locusts and wild honey, they're not prepared foods. So he's not breaking that vow that he made when he joined uh, the monastery. Uh, but uh, but now he's been out and, and he's he's actually 
preaching the message of salvation to people that the, the monks refused to preach to. So in some sense, he got kicked out of monastery to be able to uh, introduce Jesus to the world. A very, yeah, you can almost literally what, what was it that you think maybe got him kicked out according to your experiences with the Dead Sea Scrolls and yeah. going to the Holy Land? Well, I, you know, I can't prove this, but, right. but when, you, when you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the things that you pick up is that these Jewish monks had a lot of affection for the prophet Isaiah. But one element of Isaiah's teaching that they didn't seem to do anything with was the fact that Isaiah keeps talking about bringing the good news to all the nations. Mm -hmm. And I think John the Baptist picked up on that. But when he proposed that they do that, the other monks were like, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and, uh, and when he pressed it more, I think they, they said, you know, I think it's time that you leave the community. So I think that's the way it, it fell out. And he just had this fire in the bones to, to really fulfill that call from the prophet to bring the good news of salvation to all the nations that that the servant of the Lord was coming. So this area of the Dead Sea, uh, you know, has these ancient documents. Does it shed any light into Catholic liturgical laws and lifestyle that could then help us today to be encouraged that, well, around Jesus' yeah. times, this seems to be something that was a, a possibility? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the most uh, surprising things to me in studying the scrolls was the fact that this monastic community on the shores of the Dead Sea, they had what we would look at as a liturgical lifestyle. So their daily routine um, uh, all, all revolved around bathing in sacred water at about 11 o'clock in the day, which they believed that, that that's how they go into a special room and they would have a meal of bread and wine that they believed anticipated or was like an expectation of a meal that they were going to share with the Messiah uh, when he came at the end of time. And uh, you look at those two rituals, you think, hmm, washing for the forgiveness of sins, uh, sharing a meal of bread and wine. You know? Is this bringing up anything? Yeah. <laughs> Are there any sacramental life of baptism, <laughs> Eucharist, in any of this? And even confession, right? Even confession, right? Yeah, this, this, they, 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 you know, they would confess their sins before dunking themselves uh, in, in in these waters in their community. So, um, so right. So they had, you know, a, a kind of a sacramental life, you know, or, or call it what you will, proto sacramental. Because yeah, we would say no, these weren't valid sacraments in a Catholic sense, um, but they were, you know, anticipations of it. You know, they were like getting ready for what the church would be. You know. Obviously, there are differences. We have one baptism for, for life, and they were doing this daily. But uh, nonetheless, um, you know, they really had a liturgical lifestyle and a sacramental lifestyle. What would be the difference between John the Baptist's baptism and then Jesus and now what we have as a sacrament? Sure. Uh, because it seems like it was a preparation towards something that even John realized. Yeah, sure. So John says, I baptize you as a, you know, as a sign of repentance for sins, but one is going to come who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the the basic difference. These these rituals that the uh, that the monks practiced, um, the baptism that John practiced, they truly were symbolic, uh, and they were signs of expectation, uh, signs that I am expecting that one day somebody will come, whose washing will actually communicate to me the Holy Spirit, and that's what we believe about our Catholic sacraments that through them we actually receive the Holy Spirit. I mean, quint you know, the, the best example being baptism itself. But we should remember that the other sacraments also renew that presence of the Holy Spirit in us. Every time we receive the Eucharist, we're kind of renewing the presence of the Spirit with us, certainly in, in the confessional as well. And so that, that, um, that authentic, genuine activity of the Holy Spirit in the reception of the sacrament that is what makes our sacraments not merely symbols. And prior to you know Christ coming, that's what they were. They were merely symbols. Just occurred to me, and I could be off, so please correct me if that's true. It seems like in some sense we have sacramentals, like on Ash Wednesday, we'll do a rite of, of repentance, but yeah. it's not the sacrament of, of confession. Yeah. And so in some sense, John the Baptist had this baptism that was maybe a sacramental. Yeah. And then what Jesus institutes is a sacrament. Would that make sense to I, think I, like that a little bit? I'm, I'm probably throwing a curveball there like, uh, that's yeah. probably not right, Father Jay. I, but. Yeah. Well, no, I think that's a helpful way. You could look at them as, uh, you know, 
uh, proto sacramentals. I think right. in, in our theology now, that that's kind of the category that they would fill, fall into. Well, good. Before I finish this, I can't help but the, I love the Book of Tobit, and any couple that I ever marry that does the prayer of Tobit, I just love jumping into that. I also like uh, Our Lady Undoer of Knots, and underneath there, the the painting they have that beautiful uh, work of, of Tobit walking there with the with the angel on. The um, Dead Sea Scrolls, marriage, Tobit, any relationship between that? And has sure. that found anything interest of you? Oh, yeah, you? it's it's really fascinating. You know, our Lord famously in Matthew 19, he gets approached by the Pharisees on the question of divorce. And the answer he gives is the same answer that um, the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls would have given. They were a group called the Essenes. Um, they were a branch of Judaism, like uh, Pharisees or Sadducees were branches of ancient Judaism. And they had a high view of marriage. They did not approve of divorce. And um, like our Lord, they appealed to the early chapters of Genesis. They went back to Genesis 2 to ground their theology of marriage. Um, they also had a, a very high view of, of what was expected of husband and wife towards each other. And I argue in my book and in other places that they drew their theology of marriage from the book of Tobit. It was in their library. They had at least five copies, some say six copies of Tobit. That's more than uh, they had of, uh, say, you know, the book of Proverbs even, or other biblical books as well. So Tobit had an honored place in their library. And, um, you know, I think, it, I think they used as a resource and, and, and we should to this day. Well, the irony is, is that Tobit would not have been found in your Bible growing up as a boy, right? <laughs> it would not. <laughs> and so, so it's interesting how history's kind of proven us <laughs> in a direction of Tobit needs to be considered inspired, <laughs> as the church did liturgically uh, back then. So I don't know if we have a picture of, of you in the Holy Land, uh, but uh, it kind of gives a good kind of summary if we can get something up there. But anyway, you take pilgrimages to the Holy Land, and it's something that you try to do every summer. Uh, there you are. Uh, yeah. Now you'd remarked before that actually one of the co the caves is right in the back, yeah. almost right above your uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark hat, right? Yeah, exactly. Right above my hand and, and the hat there is the, the famous Cave Four. Uh, it is the most photogenic of uh, the the eleven caves that were discovered that had scrolls, and more than half of the scrolls actually were found in that one cave. Uh, you know, it, it graces the cover of many books on the Dead Sea Scrolls because it's the only cave that you can really get a good picture of because you can get back far enough and, and it looks like a cave from a distance and so on. So, uh, but yeah, we, I, I go there, yeah, I usually re lead one or two tours to the Holy Land every year. Got another one planned uh, for next uh, July. So if folks want to uh, check that out, they can uh, go to my website. I have to get some information updated because yeah, sure. some of the uh, information on my site has is, is, uh, been rendered obsolete, shall we say, by COVID. But uh, I know we were planning the pilgrimage. She was gracious enough to allow me to come along in, in June of 2021. We've had to postpone that due to COVID. But we're definitely going in the summer of 2022. I just throw that out there. Join Dr. Bergsma and I for just an amazing way to go through the Holy Land. They call it the fifth gospel for a reason. Absolutely. And I can only imagine. I don't know if we have any questions out there before we, we finish up. Ann McCarthy is our superstar scripture. I'm glad she has a question because she runs one of the greatest Bible studies in a parish I've ever seen. So, Ann, big shout out to you. Thanks for asking the question. Do you have a favorite scripture? Sure. Well, you know, I'll take that in the sense of favorite part of scripture. But yeah, the gospel of John is my favorite part of scripture. Uh, it was, uh, you know, when I was a little boy, I was given a, a red letter edition of the Bible, which fascinated me. And I quickly found that the, uh, the part of the Bible that has the most all red pages, uh -huh. meaning entire chapters that are all Jesus' words is the Gospel of John. So that quickly became my favorite. Uh, I never knew at the time that it, uh, later becoming a Catholic, I would discover it's the most sacramental of the Gospels and that it's continually pointing us to the sacraments. And that's why I enjoy it so much to this day. It's interesting that your name also has yes. that in it too. So <laughs> I feel partial to that too because of John. <laughs> yes. But uh, good. Any other questions out there? That Okay. So what was your family's reaction when you converted? And did anybody else in your family convert? Yeah. Well, first of all, I should say, did your wife convert? Because she wasn't. She did. Right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. My wife and I uh, were received at the same time. She was on her own journey into the into the faith uh, that had to do with the Blessed Mother and the, the theology of redemptive suffering, that idea that we can share our sorrows with Jesus on this cross and it helps us become holier. People take that for granted, or I should say Catholics take that for granted. But that's actually 
a very, very powerful concept that's not very much present outside the Catholic Church. And that touched my wife so deeply, that and the Blessed Mother. So she came in with me at the same time. The reaction in my family varied from uh, violent anger to <laughs> curious indifference, you know, and, and everything in between. So I had some relatives that were shouting at me and telling me I was leading my family to hell and other relatives that just, you know, couldn't care less, you know, oh, that's interesting. Well, I took up uh, basket weaving or something. So um, all those different reactions. Uh, thankfully, uh, I had one brother, uh, the one who was most violently opposed to me at first, after a year long discussion and exchanging a lot of books uh, between the two of us and him doing a lot of reading, uh, he was received at the Easter vigil the following year uh, after me. And so I've got one biological brother and his family who are also Catholics, and he's a big encouragement to me. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I remember um, hearing your story and, and seeing that, thinking about your dad, how hard that must have been. Was he alive when you uh, converted? Yeah, yeah, and what was his alive. reaction like? Yeah. Um, you know, he, uh, you know he, he wanted to make sure that I still loved uh, Jesus. And, uh, you know, when, once, once he was assured of that, um, you know, he was, uh, I wouldn't say okay with it, but, uh, but he tolerated. Right. In some sense, it was his fault. <laughs> yeah, I should have been <laughs> because, so friendly with those priests. Right. I mean, geez, Cardinal O'Connor. Yeah, and that's kind of a, right. you know, a great time. Uh, do you have any more questions out there for, okay. Anna George asks, a uh, great friend, good to see you, Anna. How can we best witness to our brothers and sisters in Christ the importance of reading and living uh, God's word? And you had mentioned at lunch today that that was one of the things that inspired you to do what you're doing now. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I would say, you know, the best way we can do this is simply to make a practice of reading the scriptures daily. There's many ways to do that. I mean, it's very simple to just read the readings for the day. Although at some point in your Catholic life, I think you should branch out and like read the Bible through, you know, make that a one year, make that your spiritual practice to read the Bible cover to cover. And, and there's, there's programs out there that divide it up for you and so on. But just make that practice of daily reading the scriptures. And, and if you do that over the course of three, four, five years, you'll begin to see how it fits together. And you'll begin to come across those passages that, that uh, form the basis of certain Catholic uh, doctrines. Um, and, and over time, uh, you'll be able to, uh, you know, to refer to those scriptures when you're in those private conversations that you have with Protestant friends or family members that have left the church, et cetera. Um, but it's not something that comes all at once. You know, you're not going to get there in a month. That's why I say it has to be a, a daily habit. If you make a daily habit of Bible reading, then over time you will, you will uh, get that biblical knowledge that you need to be able to, um, to explain and defend your faith uh, when you have those little teachable moments with, with, with folks outside the church. Right. And there's also some really good Bibles. So maybe you'd recommend a Bible or two that has good footnotes every once in a while you come across oh. some stuff and you're like, oh, my Lord, what is this saying? Yeah, I, I think on one hand, we, we shouldn't worry about, oh, do I understand every single word that the word of God will develop in itself. But do you have any recommendations of a Bible oh, without, or commentaries that you would say it was helpful? Without for doubt. Yeah. For the New Testament, I would recommend the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible Okay, uh, with the uh, study notes by um uh, Han and Mitch, Mitch yeah. uh, and that's unexcelled. Um, and for the Old Testament, I'm going to toot my own horn here. I think it's the yeah. <laughs> I, I tooted it already. That's true. Yeah, yeah. The, the Catholic introduction to the Bible, Old Testament from Ignatius Press, is uh, you know kind of a, a companion to the text of Scripture itself. Uh, will help explain those features of the Old Testament that are kind of uh, baffling at times. Dr. Bergsma, thank you for coming from Steubenville, Ohio, crossing the border here during <laughs> COVID time and covertly working with me here in Pittsburgh. I hope you don't have to like uh, uh, quarantine yourself after coming to Pittsburgh. What a pleasure and what an honor it is for me. And I can't uh, tell you, I know myself and many other priests are so grateful for the journey that you've been on, but most importantly, that courageous dive into the truth of, the, of our faith and of scripture. So I appreciate that. And thank you well, so much for, for doing that. And Quick program note, next week I have uh, Father John Horn joining me. He wrote a book called, well, he helped uh, uh, produce a book called Spiritual Husbands, Spiritual Fathers, 
on the formation of a Catholic priest. He's my personal spiritual director of the Jesuits, so hopefully won't reveal too much, but a good friend, a great priest, and somebody who has great insights into priestly formation. And so let's just finish in prayer. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners, sinners now and at the, the hour of our death. death. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you.